Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this webinar, which uh, you know has been promoted over several weeks, and um, quite excited to be moderating the discussion today. My name is Nomsam Juli, and uh, I will be moderating this panel discussion. Now, just to give you a brief background in terms of what is this about and where it emanates from. So um, last year, the, we had a webinar or the NRF hosted quite an insightful webinar, I must say. And um, it was all about the employability of doctoral graduates in South Africa. And uh, this webinar was actually inspired by the publication of the first national tracer study which was completed in 2021. And it actually looked at the career paths of doctoral graduates who obtained their qualifications from um, the country's universities. That's from the period 2000 to 2018. And uh, the study came across quite you know, interesting findings. So what was found is that the vast majority of South African doctoral students are employable. You only get around two to 3% who are struggling to find jobs. But also the data showed that 20% of these graduates were unable to find jobs within you know, their other area of training or field of expertise. And then you also get a lot of doctoral students who just keep on pursuing postdoctoral fellowships because they are unable to find jobs because there are no other alternatives. So then the NRF thought, well, you know, with what's happening in the country as well, you have the high unemployment rate, and this affects, you know, those in academia as well. So then it was decided that, well, let's rather have a webinar on, you know, focusing on a topic that speaks about cultivating an entrepreneurial and innovative mindset and culture amongst postgraduates. And what I find exciting is that we've got a panel of experts who are in academia, you know, who are entrepreneurs as well. So we are going to learn from people who have walked the journey. And what is also quite exciting is that you will have an opportunity to also, you know, see their presentations, uh, tap into their insights, but also ask them a question about, you know, some of the ideas that you might have had or some of the difficulties um, that you have maybe experience, you know, as a, a doctoral um, graduate as well. Just to take you through a couple of house rules. So we are currently, um, you know, um, live on, on Twitter, live streaming there on the NRF Facebook page. And then also um, we are, of course, on Zoom as well. So um, at some point after the... Um, presentations by our panelists, um, you will be uh, more than welcome to post your, Q, your, your um, questions as well. Um, even if, during their presentation as well, you are more than welcome to do that. Use the Q&A uh, panel box on Zoom as well as on Facebook as well. And then if your question is directed to a specific panelist, uh, please do indicate that as well. And then also, if you'd like to maybe share your experience or ask a question live on Zoom, you'll have the opportunity to do that as well. All you need to do is just raise your hand and perhaps also indicate what your question is about. And if uh, time permits, then we'll allow you to actually um, you know, go on and ask your question live on the Zoom platform. So as I said, we have an amazing panel of, of, of speakers. When I went through their bios, I was quite excited, quite um, you know, encouraged as well. So I'm really looking forward to their presentation. So I'm just going to give a brief background on who they are, uh, just their designation. And then as I introduce each speaker, when, just as they're about to do their presentation, I will then just give a full bio of their list of achievements and uh, some of the innovations that they're up to. So we've got Professor 
Mutaung. Um, she is our first panelist, acting deputy vice chancellor of research, innovation, and engagement at the Durban University of Technology, and also a founder of Global Health Biotech. We also have Professor Bavesh Khanna. He is the director, DSI NRF Center of Excellence for Biomedical TB Research at the University of the Wetzbatersrand as well. We've got Dr. Tise Zolepotu. She's a lecturer and research leader at the University of Wits and also the CEO of Nematec Biosciences um, Foundation. And then we are also joined by Dr. Anitha Ramsuran. She's the acting general manager of the Inclusive Innovation Youth and Skills Technology Innovation Agency. So as you can see, um, we really have people who are really able to speak into the subject matter and help you maneuver as you find your way as well as somebody who's a doctoral graduate, but also is trying to get into, you know, the world of, of business as well, and uh, they'll be helping us navigate all that. So our first speaker will be uh, Professor Kilebuki Lemotaung, and just a bit about her. So she's a full professor, biomedical scientist, and as I said, the acting deputy vice chancellor of research, innovation, and engagement at DUT. Uh, she has more than 24 years of experience in higher education. She is passionate about capacity building, having successfully supervised postgraduate students, and also continues mentoring emerging researchers as well. Professor Mudaung is passionate about science, technology, and entrepreneurship and commercialization, and often assisting the DSI in redefining international relations for women in STEM research. As a professor, research scientist and entrepreneur, she trains her postgraduate students, not only how to do research and become scientists, but also on how to become entrepreneurs capable of creating jobs for themselves and others as well. She founded the Global Health Biotech in 2016, and this is a company which develops natural products for medicinal plants. Quite, quite a, an impressive CV, Prof, and thank you so much for um, taking the time to be part of this uh, webinar and for imparting your knowledge. I'm going to hand over to you. Uh, thank you so much and good afternoon, colleagues. I think it's already good afternoon. And let me take this opportunity and to thank NRF for inviting me. When I saw the title, what I have to talk about, I was so excited. And then without any waste of time, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing the screen because time is definitely better on side. I'm not sure whether you are able to see. Are you able to see? You will let me know. Quite clear, Prof, go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Right now, when I had the topic of uh, cultivating an entrepreneurial mindset in South African post graduate students, for me, it was like, wow, this is exactly what I wanted to talk about. Now, the outline of my talk will be the following, um, just an introduction and the challenges and the why and the how and the solution. Because I always believe that whenever we talk about something or we criticize something, we must always come with a solution. So I will try by all means to see and to come with a solution. And the solution is because I did it and it works. And when I was going through this, people were saying I'm crazy and I'm the crazy one who was able to show that we can make sure that we make our Always graduate students to create job and to create job for themselves. Now, what are we doing at the moment? I like to start with this slide and say to you, how many times have you seen a research project go down on one path, only to realize in hindsight that it should have gone down another? Are we solving the right problems? Number two, how many times have you seen an innovation program deliver a simply breakthrough result, only to find out? It can't be implemented 
why it addresses wrong problems. You're not working addressing the sustainable development goal as an example. Now, what we need to have, many organizations need to become better at asking the right question so that they tackle the right problems. And so I always said, if you solve any problem related to sustainable development goal, whether you are a scientist, whether you are a social scientist, you must be able to take it to the market. Now, how one can able to be able to do that if we can start really looking at design thinking as a tool? Challenges are always going to be there and we cannot always talk about the challenges, not being able to talk about the solution. Now, these are the challenges and it's a fact, but I can see we are not trying to move that. We have got an idea and then what is lacking is the commercialization part. And then why I'm talking about it is because currently we do have a lack of commercialization scenario for translational products in the university. And if I have to be brutally honest and be blunt, it's because most of the people, they don't have the skills to be able to teach either the students to make them to take their research to the market. Now, lack of human resource capacity and lack of funding for entrepreneurial research. All this is, is always going to be there, but we are currently lucky because we have seen that there are venture capital that decided to come on board or to come and see how they can address this lack of funding for entrepreneurial research. Again, we cannot always start talking about these challenges because we've already got an opportunity. What is happening in reality, prototypes, which we are doing extremely well, by the way, will never move without people. What happened? May, most of major research university, their intellectual property portfolios are basing with wonderful prototypes. Quite honestly, we should not be having postgraduate students not having a job because they've already developed a prototype that they could have taken to the market and upscale it. Yet, mass majority of this invention go nowhere because we don't have qualified professionals who are interested in carrying them to the market. And I always said, perhaps I need to qualify this quality. We don't have experienced professionals who are interested to take them to the market. What we are doing extremely well, idea, proof of concept, prototype, we stop there. And we graduate, putting our red on. Now, what is happening in reality is that barrier intensity. We need to cross that bridge. You could see that I've got the bridge, the bridge that is gonna talk about commercialization. And the bridge of commercialization is going to make sure that we cultivate our postgraduate students to be able to create jobs. Now, I'm not gonna go through this commercialization part because of the time, but just to show you that when one talk about the commercialization, that's where TIA comes on board, talk about the technology readiness level. And we are lucky because TIA is always want to fund technology readiness level three upwards, where at the end of the day, it must be taken to nine to be taken to the market. I'm not gonna go there through this time, but the why is, guys, is a research proposal template. For those who know me, I will criticize this until we have to do something. This is the very template that is creating problems. The problem is that we've got with the postgraduate student is this template. And for those who's got PhD, who has attended this, they can agree with me. And even those who are studying to us, when you go and see a supervisor and you say, my name is Prof. I want to do research. The first thing that the supervisor will give you, will give you this template. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, just look at this template. Do you want to tell me from this template, are we also going to be able to train postgraduate students that can commercialize or that can be entrepreneur? No, 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 That's, it's not true. If you look at this template, it really contributes for us to train postgraduate students that are at the end of the day, not going to be able to be entrepreneur if we really have to talk about it. Now I'm just going to summarize and look at it. That is just a concept of your research you talk about your problem aims, literature research. You, this is good that you will publish a paper, which is good, of course, I'm not criticizing that, which is good that you will graduate again. I'm good, I'm not criticizing that, but I can tell you, it won't make you an entrepreneur. This template is impossible because there are so many things missing. Now, let me now tell you the solution of cultivating this entrepreneurial mindset for a postgraduate. We need to come with a kind of a solution 
where when a student is doing a PhD or a master's at an idea phase, we need to start saying, do you have a market for this project? There's no need to, we need to talk about, do you have a market? In most cases, we don't address the market. And what makes an entrepreneur, what makes an entrepreneur is a market. There's no need to have a product that you won't have a market for that. On the other hand, we need to talk about what is your competitor? Who was doing this before you? That is why you do literature review. Your literature review must be able to attract your competitor in terms of what you're doing. It also must be your problem statement, must be what problems are you solving? Currently, how are they solving this problem? What do you need satisfied? Is this a product? or a service. I had to talk about the service to make sure that I include the social scientist. Now, is your product based on the following? A novelty, accessibility, affordability, improving livelihood or social status or quality of life. This is what is important we need to talk about. And then when we talk about the customer segment, one will have to understand that who is going to buy this product? Why am I doing this research for? Of course, the society has to benefit. But remember, when the society benefits via the entrepreneurial route, you'll also be going to be able to commercialize your research. So this is for me to reverse the blue, to come where we need to incorporate some of the things that I've highlighted there. Because of uh, for 10 minutes, I cannot go through all this. Now, I want to show a case study of cultivating entrepreneurial mindset. And that case study happens to be my company, Global Health Biotech, because a lot of people talk about, I will do, I'll talk about, I did it, I walked the path, I know what were the obstacles, as I knew what needs to be changed. If we had to talk about cultivating an entrepreneurial mindset in, in, the, in our postgraduate students. If you can look at this, somebody, when I started this, of course, people told me how crazy I am. From the best professors, they tell me that cannot be done. It, nobody has never done that, especially in the birth and space. For me, I wanted to prove them wrong, that I'm going to do it. I'm the crazy one, perhaps. And then that was the title of my PhD, if you look at that. Very fun, nice title, what I am doing. But because of knowing that I want to cultivate this mindset, this entrepreneurial mindset on my postgraduate students. This was the evidence. That was the company. You can see the vision here and you can see the mission that we just wanted to be the provider of the high quality commercial medicinal plants to the middle income like suffering from musculoskeletal. By the way, this is where I started, but it has opened a lot of opportunity because I am now able to license technology from the university, which is nice. Another third income stream for my company. This is how it started. When I started with this, these two uh, 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 students by then, they were PhD students. I was so worried that am I really going to you know, to increase unemployment of red gown in, 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 the, in, the, in the country. So I had to think about what am I gonna do with them? So by the time they were doing this, they were busy with their PhD. And you could see that we had a, a patent which was uh, granted in both in South Africa and also in, in Europe, in Germany. And the beauty part, what was more important was the market. Because if you don't have a market, then you can have a beautiful product. Quite often I met entrepreneurs and they said to me, you know, Prof, I've developed such a beautiful product. Don't you want to buy it? I said, how, how can I buy a product that I didn't to check whether you will have a market? Market is very important. I'm not gonna go through this because people can read that it was a plant-derived medicinal. In a nutshell, it's just to show you that I used a plant, my research background, and produced this product, which is now in the market. So because of the biotech space that the people need to understand, it needs to go via anecdotal studies and just to make sure why I'm praising the anecdotal studies. If you want to take this kind of product, either to clicks, discam, you name it, they always want to see the safety and the efficacy, the evidence, and by the way, the anecdotal studies. So I was fortunate to use fitness junction. And I can tell you that everyone should be using this product will never be having a problem with the muscles. That is why after lockdown, I used to say to the people, you've been locking down your muscles for so long. Now unlock your muscles 
with La Africa Super. This is just to show that the product can work. Now, in closing, I want to share to tell you that what I'm preaching here is what I did at Devon University of Technology, what I have done. Yay! These are the postgraduate students supervised by this professor. What I like, the professor was part of uh, honest because they don't understand the entrepreneur. And I'm quite happy to be a duty with the space because I am given that opportunity and to assist the professors as well. So what they did here, these are the postgraduate students. And by the way, in the spin-off, even to, together with the global health, all those students, they've got shares in the company. They've got shares in the company so that they can feel that this company also belong. Some, like in my company, some they uh, even become the MD and that they can even employ and without, because I've created that so that they can know that they take ownership. So these are the two students as well, where they've also got shares in the company. This was our first spin off company at Devon University of Technology. And in this case, what we do, we take the non exclusive license. The reason for the non exclusive license is to make sure that um, they, 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 they can pay the royalties. Uh, royalties are payable to the university. We don't share equity at UT Call. Equity can be, uh, we can talk about that at the later stage, why we don't do that. So it's a non-exclusive license and somebody can ask me again why non-exclusive. For the sake of time, perhaps if they ask, I can address that later. Lastly, it was this other one. So far, we've got two uh, companies, spin-off companies, and I must say this, thanks to TIA. Thanks to TIA because they've been very supportive in terms of uh, with these products. When we start taking the products from technology readiness level three, four, five, six, seven, I mean, we will be launching this um, towards the end of, uh, between September, October, we'll be launching these companies just to make sure that we are now live. It can be done. And this was also, you can see a professor there. All the students are told them that they need to be have shares. So what we had at TUT, we do have a spin-off policy so that it can take care of this. So that students, I mean, if you are working in the lab and you've got shares, would you really want to go and look for a job? No, because you have already set up for life uh, in terms of what is happening. So in closing, I just want to say what people now venture capital want to hear nowadays, they don't want to hear an idea they want to hear a uh, uh, product. And I always said, which is also going to be a simple way to test whether are we really creating or cultivating that entrepreneurial mindset to our postgraduate students. This is the question that we must ask ourselves as professors, as researchers, as supervisors. If something happens uh, to you, a simple way to figure it out is if you have a product, now in this case, I'm gonna swap it. It's gonna be like, you need to have something to make sure that you have cultivated that mindset into the entrepreneur by hit by a track test. If you got hit by a track tomorrow and met and ultimately demands, is there something left in the company that could be sold? If your answer is yes, congratulations. If your answer is no, start building. What I'm trying to show you here, if you are, a PhD student or a master's student, and then you've got an idea, and then you, you, you've got a prototype, and then you don't have a market, please go and start again. And that, I just want to say, thank you so much. Wow, Prof, that was so, so, so insightful. And, you know, I like what you said, um, when, 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 one thing that really um, equips or students who are masters or doctoral level is that they already know how to conduct research, right? So now it's all about, you know, conducting their own research in terms of what's needed in the market and how they can fill that gap. And, and I think that's, that's very, very important. So um, thank you very much. And I was really touched by the fact that you said, you know what, you don't want to create red gowns that are unemployed. You want to create those that can be able to stand on their own two feet, create employment for themselves and also create employment for others. I think um, the route what, that you're taking is um, you know, quite powerful. And I think that you, you're going to leave quite a great legacy behind because 
you, you are empowering others who will in turn empower others. And, and this is just going to be a chain of empowerment, which is, which is absolutely great. So I'm going to move to our next speaker. Thank you very much, Prof. We'll get more time to interact on, on what you've said on your presentation. But for now, I'm going to move to Dr. Dise Zolepotu, and she's the founder and CEO of... Um, sorry, there, I'm just trying to get to uh, my, my intro there. Let me just... Uh, so the, the screen actually just um, blocked me. Let me just get to my view. There we go. <laughs> so Dr. Tisa Zoliput is the founder and CEO of Nematech Bio, uh, Biosciences Foundation, which links unemployed science graduates with science companies and also provides mentorship and career coaching. Um, she is also a research leader and principal investigator of the Nematology and Bioprocess Laboratory at the University of Wits. And she's uh, supervised over 30 postgraduate students She's considered one of South Africa's brightest minds and is very passionate about science, biotechnology, innovation, entrepreneurship, and youth development. She has a BSc, a BSc honors, an MSc, and a PhD from uh, the School of Molecular and uh, Cell Biology, and also has an MBA from the Henley Business School at the University of Reading, Doc, Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, with all your accomplishments, thank you so much for really finding the time to come and impart um, your knowledge and your experience as well. Over to you. Thank you so much uh, for the great um, welcome. And I would like to say thank you to NRF for the invitation. Uh, greetings to all of you. Actually, I need to just say that I am feeling so honored and privileged to be, you know, amongst such powerful uh, panelists whom uh, my whole life actually I've looked up to. So thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to give you, to, to give a brief about what I do, uh, a little bit of history of who I am. Um, so I'm Dr. Diseto Lepoto. Um, I'm born and raised in Soweto. I attended school, uh, primary and high school in Soweto. So um, in 2007, I joined the Vets University to study my BSc. And I just need to highlight that I, I came from uh, schools that have that had little um, or less teaching and learning resources. In fact, I always knew that I wanted to be a scientist, but at school, we, we never even had a microscope or even a science lab. So I had to use the power of imagination to basically see myself as a scientist because uh, growing up, I've always been intrigued by, 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 by nature, by growing crops. I remember at the age of five, I asked uh, my mom and dad to buy me seeds because I wanted to grow my own vegetable farm at the back of our house in Soweto. But, Little did I know that um, we will come across challenges such as pests, because I think some of you may know that, you know, there's pests everywhere. People deal with pest issues everywhere. So I did grow my crops. I, drew, I grew my strawberries and I had my nice mealies at the back of our house, but rats were a problem. And they literally kept on destroying my small vegetable farm. Fast forward to 2007, I told myself that I want to be a scientist. I've always wanted to develop solutions that can empower um, our own communities. And I decided to then proceed and study up until PhD level, um, also due to the inspiration that I got from my dad. Um, when we came for the open day at, uh, at VETS, uh, in 2007, he asked me an interesting question to say, um, why is it that those people are sitting up there with red gowns? You know, what's different about them? What's special about them? But whatever it is, I also want you to be there. And when you are there, 
I want you to inspire many other young people to get there. And that, that was actually one of the motivations that I got from my late dad. Um, and it actually pushed me to be where I am today. I just wanted to uh, show you a, a brief, let me uh, move my slide, a brief of what I did in my research. Um, so we uh, basically worked on um, this, uh, discovering um, natural enemies that can control problematic in insect, insect pests in agricultural industries. So uh, I think we all know that chemical pesticides have negative implications towards human health, the environment, and, and you know, um, they just contaminate crops and they can actually lead to develop a development of diseases in human beings. So that was interesting for me to, to venture into because when I joined the lab um, in 2011, I wanted to be part of a group um, that can come up with solutions um, for farmers, for products for farmers that they can use, organic products that they can use to control problematic insects in farms. So we found that the solution is using um, these small microscopic worms, um, which are so close to my heart. They, they are called entomopathogenic nematodes. They have an ability to infect and kill insects within 24 to 48 hours upon invasion. And these nematodes are so special because we can now be able to package them as biopesticides for farmers to use to control uh, problem pests um, in farms. So why, why are they special? They are eco-friendly. Eco they have no potential at all to infect human beings and animals. So they are host specific and we trust that um, they can help us to help farmers to control these problem pests. I just added this picture to just show you the kind of work that we do because sometimes when you think of a scientist, you only imagine a scientist in a laboratory, but since most of you are scientists and you've already gone through your research projects as doctoral um, graduates, you will know that behind the scenes, there's a lot of work that we do. So we collect our soil samples from farms, from grasslands, and we then isolate um, nematodes. But obviously when we isolate them, we don't have an idea if we are isolating which nematodes. So we do several um, molecular and morphological um, techniques to help us to identify the unknown nematodes. Um, I just put this picture here just to show you how the nematodes look like. Uh, so these are the nematodes in the white trap. They're quite interesting and it's so powerful that such small organisms are able to help us to impact the economy of South Africa and also to impact how we look at agriculture as a whole. Um, Fast forward to now, in 2016, I then did my postdoctoral research. Um, and in 2019, I got appointed in the same university that I studied in as a lecturer. And now I'm the research leader and the principal investigator in the nematology, in the nematology um, research lab. I've put this picture to show you some of my students. So I've got um, master's students, PhD students, and honor students of which most of them have also graduated already. But um, I like what, uh, I love what Professor Mutawung spoke about to say, as we supervise the students, we don't just want them to walk away with a degree or to just walk away with the red gown. So I also always instill, um, you know, the spirit of, of, of innovation and entrepreneurship amongst my students. I inspire them when I do things also within the university and outside the university, I do take time to invite them to come and participate at Nematech Biosciences as volunteers, of course. And hopefully um, the aim is to then get them also to work for Nematech and also to get the opportunity to impact other young people. So I really loved what uh, Professor Mutaum said. And I also needed to mention that um, you know, in 2019, when I founded Nematech, um, you know, I was still trying to find my way in the field. 
and Professor Mdaum, you know, made time for me uh, um, and she encouraged me as she has so much energy and passion for scientists to also be innovative. And I thank her for that. Um, so I just wanted to also talk about how being a scientist has made me to be innovative, has inspired my innovative spirit. So I also, since, um, since I started my degree, literally, I, I, I saw the need to go back to my community and to visit other communities in rural areas and to, to teach them about science, to teach them about the things that we do, because I know how it feels like, you know, to go to a school that has little teaching and learning resources, no microscopes, no um, science labs, but still be able to be a globally recognized scientist um, who has traveled the world and who has been invited to so many conferences. So I didn't want to sit with that and, you know, just, you know, give it, give myself glory, but I decided to, every Saturday, I literally teach science and maths uh, in partnership with GoMed. So we even go to schools, we teach maths and science, we encourage young people to be aware of the careers that we have in science. So I've been doing that then until now, I still do it. Um, even during COVID, uh, that didn't stop us because we were able to create WhatsApp groups and Facebook live videos where we still continue to teach learners in primary and high school uh, maths and science. Uh, not only that, so I also decided to give them a practical feel of, um, of science where I did what I used to do when I was five, year, five years old, uh, which is growing crops. And as you can see in the picture there, I've got students or learners. I think these learners were in grade nine and I was teaching them how to grow their own spinach, grow their own mealies. And so interestingly, they were able to even get some of the crops and take them home to eat. And some of them actually, we encourage them to sell um, the, the, the vegetables that they've grown in, in the local community. So I feel that by just doing that, we have not only shown them that, you know, science is cool, science is possible, science can change lives, but we've also shown them that you can use science to, to generate an income. Um, so uh, as of last year, um, with the help of um, the Department of Science and Innovation, I, I then um, decided to venture into um, linking unemployed science graduates with biotechnology companies. And currently I'm even thinking of linking them with other companies because I believe that as scientists, we are not trained to be in a box. We think creatively, we think innovatively, um, we are special. So I, I, I organized with my Nematech team, uh, what we call the Science Graduate in Daba, whereby we invited unemployed science graduates and also the employed science graduates. And we also invited companies from you know, all walks of life to come and give talks and also to share opportunities with our graduates. And I'm proud to, to announce that they, there are companies in South Africa that have now opened up opportunities for our graduates. They've invited them for graduate programs, internships, et cetera. And they, we keep them in the loop of the graduates in the program. So I'm also looking forward to, to, to the Indaba that we will be hosting uh, very soon this year in June and also in December. Um, uh, lastly, you know, being a scientist, didn't only, you know, make me to always want to, you know, just go out there and help people, but it also made me to want to sit down and think of other products that I can innovate, except for the ones that are linked to my research projects. Um, so um, in 2020, I gave birth to my son and I started losing my hair. It was so disturbing because I'm fond of my hair. I love my hair. In fact, I'd never cut my hair. But I started losing my hair um, after, you know, giving birth, and that actually inspired me to innovate a product that can help women 
to grow their hair, not only pregnant women or you know postnatal issues, but I've just came up with a product called Afro Royal by Nematech that can help women to grow their hair and also to repair their hairline. Um, and interestingly, um, my husband started using these products um, because he noticed that he had signs of balding as young as we are. Um, so uh, I'm also happy to say that the products also helped him to recover his hair. So that actually inspired me to grow the business and to also invite other science graduates to be part of the Nematic uh, Bioscience um, Afro Royal group uh, to innovate more products for growing hair and also for treating skin, dry skin. Um, and with that said, I just you know, wanted to share a practical feel of what being a scientist has done for me and what science will do for you only if you don't box yourself. Um, and you know, I also would like to encourage you to go to conferences, seminars, because in 2019, Nematech was invited to the Entrepreneurship World Cup whereby Nematec was actually uh, in the top 100 out of 100,000 applications that were received globally. And out of the 100 um, uh, entrepreneurs, as Nematec, we came um, in the top 40, and then we then made it to the top 14 globally. And for me, being there in Saudi Arabia, speaking about biopesticides, um, I, was, I felt very humbled because I, I, I saw that the work that we do as scientists has a potential to impact the world, not only South Africa, but also the world, because people were so interested in how nematodes can kill insects and how you know, the products that we can innovate through science can you know, um, impact the economy positively. So I'd like to just say, um, let's, let's think innovatively, let's be positive, um, let's also stop this. Uh, I want to say, if you have a qualification and you say, I'm not getting a job, but the skills that you've gained um, as a scientist can actually make you to be the one to create jobs. So with that said, thank you so much. Yo, Dr. Lepot, wow, this is so encouraging. So just a couple of things that I've taken from your presentation. And I'm so happy that, you know, we have a panel of three incredible women, plus the guy as well. But, the, you know, the majority of this pan panel is made up of, of, of women who have done it, who are doing it, and that we can relate to as well. I look at you, I'm young, you young. And I'm sure a lot of people who are joining us as well, you know, we more or less of the same age group and, and you've really encouraged us. And I'm, I'm just also so encouraged in terms of and fascinated what you've been able to do um, with your knowledge. You're feeding us, making sure that the food that we consume is of good quality, you know. Um, <laughs> Ah, uh, hey, you know, women in here, but it, it forms part of our beauty as well um, and, and form a, a part of our identity. So also that, but also through the work that you're doing is that you are empowering others and opening doors for others as well. So whew, quite encouraging. Okay, so we're going to also unpack in, uh, in terms of what you've said, but I've, I've learned a new word today and I just want to try and um, pronounce it. Entomopathogenic. Nematodes. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. So we'll, we'll unpack more and uh, post questions to you after the pre presentation by Prof. Ba Bavesh Khanna as well as Dr. Anitha Ramsuran. Right now I'm going to go to Prof. Bavesh Khanna and uh, also just read about his, his work as well. Now, he directs the DSI NRF Center of Excellence for Biomedical TB Research, a national center with nodes at the Wits University, Stellenbosch, and also the University of Cape Town. His research focuses on developing new TB drugs with shorter treatment durations and fewer side effects. He's also translated his research into products 
um, that enable quality assurance and verification of TB diagnostic devices. And this has led to the spin-off of a biotech company. And currently these products are being used in over 50 countries globally. In 2020, he pivoted this technology to support national diagnosis of COVID-19 through supporting laboratories and the public sector. He created a new series of products that enable mass testing in South Africa, which have now been rolled out to 34 countries. Uh, for these and related activities, his team was awarded the South African National Science and Technology Forum Innovation Award in 2021. He's also a recipient of the CEO Titan Award. Doc, thank you so much. I know you're, you're, as you're trying to save the world, uh, you also made time as well um, to come and address us. So over to you. Uh, thank you, Nomsa. So I'm the, I'm the Y chromosome. I'm representing the men. <laughs> not, so, not so sure about the youngsters. Um, uh, just let me share my screen. So, so thank you. It's, it's deeply humbling to be amongst uh, such an esteemed panel of, of uh, presenters. Um, so I'm going to share our journey in the innovation ecosystem from a perspective of trying to strengthen the diagnostics value chain. Um, and really, I hope during this during this, um, this talk, some of the lessons and some of the experiences that we've had really shed some light on those individuals who are embarking on this journey. So, so, so our work has primarily been, been focused on trying to improve um, the diagnostics value chain. And thanks to COVID, I hope I don't have to explain molecular diagnostics to anybody. Most people are now familiar with laboratory diagnostics and PCR diagnostics. But I guess what people are most familiar with is actually getting your results. But actually, there's a whole lot of stuff that occurs prior to that in order for you to be able to get your result. And that involves collection of the sample, some sort of transportation of that specimen to a laboratory, the laboratory then conducts the test and you finally get a result. But in order for you to actually, as, a, as an individual receiving a result, in order for you to have confidence in the result, a whole lot of things have to happen. And I'm sure there are individuals who, you know, who had a panic, ran down to the drive-in, gave a swab, got a COVID result and looked at it and said, I don't believe this. There's something wrong. It's saying I have COVID and I'm not sick or I'm really sick and it's saying I don't have COVID. And so this is really central to the delivery of quality healthcare. How do we ensure that laboratories give quality results? And so that's really Really where our innovation sits in. And in order for me to explain that, we need to explain a little bit about how laboratories work. And laboratories need to have two processes that occur constantly. The first is they need to ensure that they have good quality assurance systems. And these quality assurance systems need to cover everything. Are they handling the specimens appropriately? Do they have a good workflow? You know, are they actually the laboratory staff? Are they actually executing the diagnostic test correctly? Is the diagnostic device working? Um, and, and when the result is generated, is the, is the result actually captured correctly in the laboratory information system? System. And so for all of this, labs need to have continuous proficiency testing systems to make sure that all the individuals and all the systems in the lab work. The second component, and this really became very important in the context of COVID, is as new tests enter the market, and labs implement new tests. Are these new tests fit for purpose? You know, do they benchmark well against the existing tests? Do the protocols work? Have the tests been deployed appropriately? And again, for this, you know, laboratories need to have appropriate proficiency testing programs in place. And so this proficiency testing and quality assurance is actually very central to all laboratories. And in order for labs to be able to do that, they need to have a known sample, right? So if we want to know whether a lab is doing coronavirus testing properly, we actually need to give the lab some coronavirus and say, do they get the right results? So, so this is called a verification or a control sample. And, and without these samples, actually labs have no quality Quality, they can't put quality systems in place, quality assurance systems in place, and, and they can't generate results. And in environments such as South Africa, where a lot of laboratory testing occurs in the context of laboratory networks, you then have imminent collapse of the health system. So this idea of building quality into laboratory diagnostics is really central. And so the, the gap we were called on to fill you know, about a decade ago is to develop the need for biologically safe control to keep quality in labs you know, as high as is possible. And really, I'm going to take you back to about 12 years ago um, when South Africa decided to pioneer the rollout of molecular diagnostics for TB. Tuberculosis is caused by bacteria. And generally, the way we used to diagnose TB is to use a, a test that's over 100 years old. We, we look for the bacteria under a microscope or we culture the organisms. The organisms take very long to grow. They're very lazy. It takes up to 42 days to be able to get a result. And so this is really terrible in the context of the health system. Sometimes people have to wait very long to get their results. And so address this. The government decided to take this approach of, of using molecular diagnostics. So molecular diagnostics 
detect a molecule within the pathogen. In this case, it was DNA. And the idea was to roll out these molecular diagnostics at all microscopy level centers around the country. And this map just shows you sort of microscopy level centers and the volumes that they use of TB testing laboratories in the country. And so basically we wanted to put this new this new diagnostic device, it was called the Gene Expert. Um, and we wanted to make sure that when this device is placed in all the laboratories, that it actually worked. And so, so the first problem the program came across is how do we build you know, the need for biologically safe controls. TB bacteria are dangerous. We can't send TB bacteria to all these labs. We're gonna make people sick. And so, so really we were stuck at that point. And, and this is where the National Priority Program for TB approached my lab and said, look, can you, can you guys make this problem go away? Um, and so really, that's where we turn to this idea of biomimicry. You know, and biomimicry, and, and, I, and I use Wikipedia because that's where everyone goes for, for information. Biomimicry, as the name implies, is just a mimicking of biological systems. And it's based on the premise that nature has spent millions of years of evolution solving problems that we face today. And you can really see examples of it all around. You know? so, so my most favorite example of biomimicry is the color blue. So the color blue is a natural pigment. It doesn't occur a lot in nature. So when you see these blue butterflies, that's actually a mimic of blue color. The butterfly wing has folds that absorb all different colors and reflect back blue color. And in fact, those of you with blue eyes, the same phenomenon occurs. There's no blue pigment in your eye. The iris is absorbing all the colors and reflecting back blue. But in terms of more functional uh, implications, the, the, the Velcro is actually based on biomimicry. It's based on these birds that get stuck you know, in your pants as you walk through the felt. And this Japanese high speed train is, you know, designed on the shape of the kingfisher as it dives. So there's, there's lots of examples of how biomimicry has improved our lives. And so how do we use biomimicry to solve this problem, right? So here's, here's the problem. We have these live TB bacteria and we need to develop a QC system that allows labs to make sure that they're getting the testing right. And so the way the devices are working, they detect a piece of DNA. So that's a, that's the gene expert. It detects a piece of DNA in the TB bacteria. And so the first thing we, we said is, how can we make this as simple as possible? We don't want to over-engineer it. And so we said, well, does the gene expert actually care whether the bugs are alive or dead? All it's looking for is this piece of DNA. And so what we did was we generated a production line in the lab to, to generate la large amounts of dead TB bacteria. We had to keep the bacteria whole and we had to make sure they were monodispersed. Um, and we just made sure that we preserved the integrity of that piece of DNA and we had our first product. You know, we gave these dead bacteria to the gene expert. It didn't, these TB diagnostic devices didn't, didn't care. They said this was TB and we were getting the expected result. And so this was, this was really great. We were able to give this to labs initially and labs were able to bring TB testing online in 2011 and 2012. But there were limitations to this approach, right? The first thing is the bacteria were hard to grow. As I said, TB bacteria take very long to grow. So it takes us about a month to grow up the bacteria, then we kill them, and then we have to wait about two months to make sure that they're all dead before we can send them out. So if a lab calls us up saying, you know, we, we, need, we need controls, we tell them, you have to wait three months. And that, that's kind of the wrong answer. It took very long, um, you know, and we had to get into these PSL3 suits, we had to grow this under containment conditions. So it was incredibly expensive. So whilst we had a product that worked, it was not suitable for the market needs. And so we had to go back to the drawing board to say, you know, how can we make this even more simpler? And what we did was we again turned to biomimicry and what we found are these, these harmless bacteria that grow in the sand. They're very similar to TB bacteria. They're very quick to grow, but they're not pathogenic. They don't make anyone sick. They're really robust. And what we did was we basically took that piece of DNA that gets detected by these diagnostic devices and we transferred it into these harmless bacteria. And lo and behold, these diagnostic devices didn't know the difference. They call these harmless bacteria TB2. And, and so this was really great. There were lots of benefits. There was a dramatic reduction in cost. It came down to a few South African cents per batch of the product. It was easily scalable. Those people who needed it were able to get it. And so just to give you a sense of how we deployed this, we actually took these dead bacteria. I mean, if you imagine TB testing labs around the country, um, we took the bugs, we mixed them with a bit of color, and we put them onto a little piece of filter paper. This is a, as a dried culture spot. So you see this little piece of, 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 of filter paper that has a blue spot. Uh, you know, so we, we grow up the organisms, we kill them, we, we stain them, and then we use a, a method to quantify the organisms, and we put a known number onto that little dried culture spot, and there's a barcode. We then deploy those culture spots, um, you know, across the laboratories. We know the results. Those labs don't know the result, and we can actually monitor them using cloud-based software. And those labs that get the right results, we turn them on. We say, you're fine. You've passed your QC and proficiency testing systems. You can go ahead and test and report results to a patient. And so, so this is how we scaled it initially in South Africa and, and eventually you know, through the world. So between 2010 and 2012, we were able to 
It enabled the rollouts of lots of molecular diagnostics for TB across all provinces in South Africa. Um, we've spun out a company, Smart Spot Quality. Um, and then we also got the WHO and CDC endorsement for the product. And subsequent to that, you know, there was a demand from lots of countries in Africa for the product. There was a demand from other continents. And, and currently we support about 51 countries, you know, from our little lab here in Brompton, we make these things. And through SmartSpot, we support about 51 countries in their TB testing programs. Many of these are through the national testing TB priority programs. Um, and, and then came COVID, you know, and, and as with everything, our lives were turned sideways. And the first thing the government did was they came to us and they said, can you help us this through the NHLS? Can you can you help us um, create um, uh, COVID diagnostic controls? And so, so here's the virus. I'm sure we're all sick of looking at it by now. And basically, COVID PCR testing involves extraction of the RNA, conversion to the DNA, and then the DNA is actually detected by tests. And so, so initially, when the when the pandemic started here in 2020, um, you know, the the there was a big there was a big roadblock in getting enough diagnostics out. And, and the first issue was we didn't have enough diagnostic tests. When we finally got enough diagnostic tests, then there was the problem of having controls. And so again, we were approached and we took, we took the simplest route again. We took these harmless bacteria, you know, we took the little regions of the coronavirus that get detected by diagnostic tests and we engineered them into these bacteria in a very careful way. There's no gain of function or we didn't create anything dangerous, but we created this organism that had chimeric DNA. And basically this chimeric DNA gets detected by, by tests, then, you know, a variety of different coronavirus tests. And, and so what we were able to do was create the world's very first safe biological coronavirus mimetic. And we deployed it very much um, in the same way. And we were able to bring, you know, South African testing online through the NHLS. Um, and, and, you know, at that point, the health system got unstuck and, and people were able to get their results. And, and currently, we support around 37 countries. It's 34. This, a couple of countries have come online in the last few months, you know. So again, from our lab, we, we help a lot of countries do mass testing for COVID by providing them with, with biologically safe controls. And, and so really our success is built on this back of powerful polyvalent technology platforms. And, and so, so what do I mean by that? So we had a technology platform we were able to use for TB, and then we were able to pivot that same thing for, for, for COVID testing. And so, so this really illustrates, this slide really illustrates the benefit of building technology platforms. So in 2000, 2017, this is what we look like. This is what our technology portfolio looked like, you know, and and now this is what it looks like. It's expanded to a whole lot of other diseases. Each one of these little boxes is either a, a product or a product series. Um, we're also developing things for typhoid, leprosy, cholera. Uh, we have a big program on antimicrobial resistance. And then, you know, with the outlook that self-testing will soon come to South Africa, you know, we're also developing controls for, for self-testing. And so, so that's the first thing I would say to people. Think about building technology platforms or, or platform technologies. And I'll just finish off uh, with some reflections. Yeah, you know, it's been a very interesting journey for us. It's been deeply humbling to be able to reach out all over the world from our labs in Bromfontein and, and create impact and help hundreds of thousands of people access quality diagnostics. And, and so, that, so that's the first thing I will say is that, um, you know, working for something that you don't care about equals to stress. Um, and so, so don't confuse that with passion. You know, sometimes you're just working, working, working all the time, going from one thing to the next. You're not necessarily passionate about it if you don't care. So, so find something to care about. Um, the next thing I, I would say to people is go for what you want. Um, often in, in the in the African in, and in the South African setting, you hear people saying, you know, I want to do this, but, you know, people, people, people often see the barriers rather than what they want to do. And, and so, so I'd like to say to you not to see the barriers anymore. You know, um, you know, we have very modest labs here in Brompton. Anyone is welcome to visit. We have all the same problems that everybody has. The ceiling has fallen in on the lab two times. You know, we have problems with the electricity supply. The plumbing doesn't work, but we didn't let that stop us. You know, from here, as I say, we reach out all over the world. So, so this is what I say to you. You are not defined by your resources. You are defined by the quality of your thinking and, and the reach of your imagination. And history and the world will probably say a lot about us South Africans, but, but never let it be said that we were unimaginative. Um, the next thing I would say to you is just to learn to listen. You know, and I'm sure you've heard this before, learn to listen, learn to listen. And, and here, I, I really like to quote a story I heard from, from Simon Sinek, who, who was talking about Madiba. You know, once Madiba was asked, what makes you such a great, what makes you such a great leader? Um, and he, he said, you know, when he was young, he went to tribal meetings with his father and two things happened. They always sat in a circle and his dad was the last person to speak. And so this is what I would say to you, be the last person to speak. You know, you often think as the academic or as the scientist, you have all the answers, you have all these great ideas. 
but listen to the people who are posing the problem to you and make sure that your IGO solution is compatible with the problem. Uh, the third thing I'll say to you is take accountability. We live in a society where this has become such a problem. Take about accountability for all your failures. You're gonna have to fail to succeed. This is a balanced equation. Don't be knocked down by failure. Um, and then and then be humble. You know, you know, science, entrepreneurship, and innovation will humble you day in and day out. And when you have success, always remember that you know that success is built, is usually built on a mountain of failure. And so humility is, is incredibly important. Um, the final thing I will say is that, and this has really been very important for us. Uh, both previous speakers have mentioned local funders. We would not have been able to do you know, what we were able to do, not have this global impact if it wasn't for our local funders. You know, and so yeah, I'd really like to acknowledge the National Research Foundation who funded us through the Center of Excellence Program, the Department of Science and Innovation who provided the funding, the Technology Innovation Agency, the South African Medical Research Council, a host of individuals, local funders who saw the importance of what we do and funded us in a very bold way and allowed us to create this level of global impact. And so there's a lot of people to thank. And, and with that, I'll stop um, and, and, take, uh, and take any comments in the question and answer session. Thank you very much. Which we will do at, at a later stage, um, Prof. And what I liked about it is that, you know, you've, you've taken us behind the technology side of things and, you know, how you've been able to accomplish what you've accomplished, but you've also given us advice in terms of the type of character that one needs, um, you know, to, to, to succeed in this fear. Um, humility, things like humility, you know. And, and what, I, you know, as I went through your, your profile and, and I mean, some of the, the projects that you've been involved in, I remember reading a story recently that TB clinics are actually closing down, you know, mm. clinics that specialized in treating uh, TB and they're being repurposed now into um, community service clinics. And that's good news because we no longer need people who stay um, in, in, for, who stay in hospital TB uh, treatment hospitals oh. for long because of, you know, these kind of innovations and, and, and really people like you have come up with solutions, shorter treatment, people can be treated from home. So that also saves money for the state. And that means that, you know, these kind of buildings and services can then be rolled out for the benefit of the entire community as well. And, and that has actually been happening country-wise. So um, we will and also unpack um, your presentation as well, and also uh, open up the floor to um, those who are, uh, you know, part of this webinar as well. But before then, I am also going to introduce our last speaker, and that's Dr. Anitha Ramsuran. She is currently the acting head of strategic partnerships and stakeholder engagements as well as the manager for innovation for inclusive development at the technology information agency which is known as tia she is currently a tia nominated board member of innovative um, durban and also deputy president of the eskom expo science board she was also a past board member for 10 years at the south african technology network which is now known as tensa Previous to her role at TIA, she was head of department at the Innovation Fund, managing a national program for schools on innovation and entrepreneurship. Her previous roles included director of governance at the Department of Science and Innovation, where she managed the governance and uh, performance of DSI entities. She's senior lecturer and member of council at UKZN, responsible for an honors program and the high school educator for maths, life sciences and physical science. And, and Doc, with all that busy schedule, you still made time uh, to come and join us this afternoon, to come and share your insights and uh, to help us navigate through this issue of cultivating an entrepreneurial mindset amongst uh, postdoctorals or doctoral graduates rather. So thank you so much and over to you. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Chairperson, and thank you very much uh, uh, for the acknowledgement of TIA by the previous speakers. I felt like you did my work. I should just pack up and go home. Uh, but I want to actually talk to the students about 
the opportunities and the resources available at TIA. Our key focus at TIA is about creating these innovative instruments to assist uh, innovators to move along the innovation value chain. Now you would uh, find it actually pains us tremendously. And if you do listen to our CEO, he would repeat this in every forum. It pains us that we have students that graduate but cannot uh, cannot uh, find employment. We have students that go on to high levels of research, but are not able to get into the innovation stream. So what I'm going to present to you is a little bit more insight into what TIA offers, the programs that we have, and hopefully we'll get some applicants coming from the student population or the NRF community that is sitting in this webinar. So I will... Um, I'm not sure why my slide is not moving. Okay, so I will tell you, uh, starting off with what TIA, how was TIA formed? TIA was actually formed in 2010 by the merger of seven entities. Uh, I was in one of the previous entities, uh, the Innovation Fund. So you can see that I'm quite part of the furniture at TIA. TIA was established to promote development and exploitation in the public interest. So we are very concerned about citizens of the country. It must be in the public interest of discoveries, inventions, innovations, and improvements. And our role is to support the state in stimulating and intensifying technology in, uh, innovation. So you heard from Prof Shelley early on about TIA, where TIA fits in. We, we look at coming in, uh, where you come in with your innovation at proof of concept, but we have currently or recently designed new instruments that actually go take you from ideation. So it's very important the lessons that you've uh, that you've got from the previous speakers in terms of how you enter the the tier system. Now you will notice that uh, from this slide that our focus uh, currently uh, our funding currently majority of our funding has been going to Kauteng, the Western Cape, and KZN. We want to shift the demographics. Uh, we want to shift that to underserved provinces. So we are looking actively for good opportunities that are available in the other provinces, particularly in Pumalanga and the Northern Cape, that has a very low uh, uptake of our funds. And if you look on the right-hand side, you will see that currently uh, our focus uh, in terms of youth is quite low. And we know that the youth are sitting in the audience. We are waiting for your proposals to come to TIA so that we could look into them and we could fund them because youth is top in terms of our agenda of uh, supporting your, your proposals. So what does actually TIA fund? Now we have organized ourselves internally into three divisions. The first is our commercialization division. And this division is key to take opportunities to the market. In fact, we've uh, we recently uh, in the last two years have been working very closely with DSI in implementing what we call the innovation fund. The innovation fund is a commercial instrument. It's an instrument where you would, uh, it's an instrument that you would, excuse me, it is an instrument that you would take your products into the market. That instrument has a return. So if we are providing you with funding in that instrument, we expect a return on our investment, a monetary return on our investment. And we have a number of sectors that actually feed into that particular instrument, which is the advanced manufacturing, energy, ICT, natural resources. Now, some of the things we look at and we're funding, and I'm just gonna pick on one example in this particular division, is we look at collaboration with industry. So it's important as Prof mentioned earlier that you need to find your market, but it's also that you need to find in your market, who is gonna be your industry partner or your customer that's gonna be buying your product. It's important that, that you do that. And, and in most cases, your industry partner comes in with joint funding. So we have this uh, technology called Jobox. And this is a platform that vets employees uh, that are looking for work and work experience. And this currently, this platform is currently in a licensing agreement with UKZN and uh, who has adopted this platform and are using this platform for student vetting uh, for work experience. Uh, we also look at our technologies that are diffused for inclusive uh, innovation or inclusive development. So it's very important that we don't only talk about what can uh, the technology achieve in commercialization for profits, but what can it achieve 
to uh, for social impact. And I'll quickly uh, talk about Fiber Point. Fiber Point is a solution where they provide last mile access. So last mile access for connectivity. Uh, many of you are familiar, if you go deep rural, you don't get connectivity because your internet service providers, Telcom, uh, CELC, Vodacom, are not, are not interested in putting infrastructure in those deeply rural areas. So what this does is it hauls, it backhauls uh, connectivity and is able to provide you with connectivity in communities that don't have internet access. But they roll, the, the rollout will depend on a particular business model that is innovative in the sense that it is not the innovator that will go and deploy at every, in every community. The business model is based on youth in that community, being part of the business, being able to sell vouchers, being able to control the network, being able to take care of technical concerns or technical issues with the network. We also have uh, uh, a huge portfolio and uh, Prof uh, uh, that spoke the last speaker uh, falls within this, his funding came from this particular folder and uh, uh, portfolio, sorry. And this portfolio actually talks about how we could look at the bioeconomy space based on the implementation of the bioeconomy strategy of the DSI from 2013. And in this area, we have a focus on agriculture, a focus on health, a focus on indigenous knowledge systems, industrial biotech. We have clusters and we have platforms. I will tell you a little bit more about them in my next slide. Uh, so some of the bio-based technologies, uh, we've got enzyme technology based in KZN, uh, not too far away from uh, our platform in KZN. And this is a technology that uses enzymes from pineapple and is able to produce, uh, is able to produce uh, botanical extracts that is used in medicines, food and beverage products. Now, these technology platforms that I mentioned, these platforms are research and innovation platforms. So any one of you, the students uh, in this meeting are able to gain access to this platform. You, This platform has been equipped with, these platforms have been equipped with high-end infrastructure to provide you with analytical services, helping you with prototype development, your technology scale up, validating your technology quality assurance. So in the main, these platforms are intended to de-risk the investment that TIA will make in your particular project so that you can go to a facility that has high-end equipment to be able to validate, get advice, do your data analysis, et cetera. Uh, and since we've been talking a lot about COVID in the session, I'd, I'd like to just give you uh, what the KZN Research Innovation and Sequencing Platform has done during the COVID period. This platform is based at UKZN, it's commonly known as CRISP. And during uh, this platform was responsible for identifying the Omicron virus, uh, for those of you who read in the papers, you know that it was uh, it was discovered here in South Africa. Uh, and uh, the, the, the researchers at that particular platform had was responsible for doing that. We have various other platforms, which you can see on my slide, and I will make the presentation available to the, to the group that's in this meeting so that uh, if you need any support, you can contact us directly and we'll able to direct you to the appropriate platform. Uh, we have the technology, uh, okay, I'm not going to go through this. Uh, one of our uh, large uh, platforms is in UCT on drug dis uh, discovery. Prof Shabali, many of you know him in the community, leading scientist uh, that is leading very important work on TB and HIV treatment. Okay, we've also set up a cluster program. So a cluster is actually a program that brings together industry, researchers, funders, uh, entrepreneurs uh, in, in, in one group. And uh, the last cluster that we launched uh, in 2016 was the active pharmaceutical ingredient cluster that was launched at uh, uh, with CPT Pharma and uh, Northwest University and other partners. And uh, this cluster now is looking at bringing forth new active pharmaceutical ingredients to the market. Um, the last area of work that we focus on is assisting MS SMMEs. Uh, and this is our innovation enabling division. This division talks uh, has various instruments to enable innovation 
And I will, I will talk about a few of these instruments in my next few slides. Right, one of the instruments we have is the technology stations. So these are stations that are located at universities and universities of technology. They, are, they have innovation equipment as well to deal with all the services that you see on the right-hand side. And uh, one of the technology stations, I'll talk about, uh, I'll talk about DUT because it's uh, DUT's uh, prof is in the meeting. We have two technology stations from DUT that's, uh, uh, that we have funded. One is based on energy. So any, this, uh, any type of uh, solution, advice, expertise, equipment, you're looking for energy technologies, renewable energy, you can access the technology station at DUT, and the other technology station deals with prototyping and uh, rapid prototyping and uh, and manufacturing. So those two technologies, are, uh, technology stations are available and they are available at a national level. So you can access any of these technology stations. There are 18 of them in the country and uh, they uh, work in various fields. We've got an agri-processing technology station at CPUT, as well as the University of Limpopo. We've got a chemical technology station at Mangasuti University of Technology, as well as Chwane University of Technology. At the CSR, we've got an electronics technology station. So you can see that they all over the place, they ex you are able to access that uh, at a national level. These are some of the products that are coming out from a technology station. Uh, one on your left-hand side is an e-certifying device where instead of waiting for long queues uh, in government institutions to get your birth certificate stamped or your passport stamped or certified, uh, this device will be made available to commissioners and the process will is significantly reduced. The time process is significantly reduced. Okay, now many of you, uh, uh, particularly researchers uh, from universities, are familiar with TRC fund. It has, uh, it has been uh, uh, structured in 2012 when we launched it. And the main reason we launched it was because a lot of researchers came back to TIA to say they are not able to access TIA's funding because they don't have funding at the university for some of the activities and the activities are listed on the right uh, to actually prove that a concept works. So TIA takes normally a TIA level three where you have proved the concept, but sometimes you need funding to prove the concept. And that's where this particular fund comes in. It's to help with prototype development, sourcing of IP opinions, producing market samples, refining in your designs, conducting field studies, et cetera. And uh, in TIA, we have two types of seed funds. One is based at universities and science councils. It's called the HEI seed fund. And the other is based with our regional development partners, uh, which we call the SMME. Uh, seed fund. Now, to date, we may have invested uh, about four in about 400 technologies uh, through this fund. And most of these technologies are coming from researchers, students, uh, a sector at higher education institutions. Uh, we also have a dedicated unit for enterprise development. And through a partnership with many uh, international organizations, the key focus will be on innovation skills, entrepreneurial skills, innovation management skills, workplace learning and critical thinking skills. So they run programs with the Swiss Embassy, with the Newton Fund and various other organizations to deliver their programs. Right, this is the area of work that I particularly work in. It's innovation for inclusive development. And this is to provide, uh, to provide innovation, innovative solutions to solve societal challenges. So many of us, and we listen to, uh, uh, Dr. Leporto earlier, and we heard about her background uh, coming from very poor indigent communities, rural and township environments, but they may have brilliant solutions that can actually address those challenges. And this uh, unit actually funds those kinds of, of solutions. We have uh, three main focus areas, a grassroots innovation program, which I will talk about in more detail, innovation for service delivery. So we look at what are some of the service delivery challenges faced by municipalities, local government, national government? What, what kind of innovation can we bring in? How can we get innovation introduced into procurement systems of government departments so that they'll be able to take on South African innovations instead of investing in innovations from elsewhere? 
And then we have focus on innovation for local economic development, looking at how we can introduce innovation in the local government space. Um, this grassroots innovation program, and, and, I, and I want to say that this program currently I have, uh, we've initiated, we've launched this program in 2019, it's about three years, three to four years ago. And we currently have 150 innovators across all nine provinces in the program. Interestingly, uh, high percentage of them are youth, about 90% of youth have applied to this program. And a number of students of university, university students have applied. Now, if you are a university student and you are part of a research group, uh, just say you're part of Prof. Shelley's research group on, uh, on med medicinal science, uh, and you're getting funding from the NRF, you're getting funding from TIA, then you ought to be eligible to apply to this fund. But just say you are a Nomashlube, you are you studied polymer science, and now you are you are a graduate, but you've got this brilliant solution of converting waste products, uh, fish scales, etc., into wound care products, which is Nomashlube that you see in the slide. This is what she's done. She's a polymer scientist. She's uh, taken her research and she's now applied it. Uh, and is able to produce wound care products. She's now uh, she's now expanded into other parts of Africa as well. So you can come to TIA through the Grassroots Innovation Program, and we can fund you uh, with regards to your solution. So the, uh, we have achieved quite a lot of success with this particular program in terms of creation of jobs, in terms of number of products that we put into the market from research that has been done. Now, when we looked at the demographic of this uh, of this program and why, uh, what kinds of uh, youth were actually applying to this program, interestingly, it was youth that had uh, qualification, maybe not in this particular area that they wanted to innovate in. Maybe it was in some other area, but they did recognize a challenge that they could address, a community challenge, uh, which they wanted to address. But we looked at people, uh, some people actually had a full-time job, but decided to leave the job to actually pursue an opportunity in innovation, which we found was a very interesting uh, group uh, to actually come and leave their full-time job and innovate. And some of them have been very successful in actually creating the, the startups and getting into the market and actually uh, creating jobs for not only themselves, but for everybody else in their team. Now, what do, we, what do we offer in the Grassroots Innovation Program? We offer you with a, a grant of 260,000. 60 out of the 200,000 is actually used as a stipend for you to move around, meet your customers, come to a technology station if you need the resources there. So it's a, it's a kind of a living allowance that we could provide you with. The 200,000 is we provide you with that support to develop your technology. We also assist you with idea development, validating your business model, giving you business and technical skills training, assisting you with networking. We have a number of platforms by which we, we, would, we would put you for getting market access opportunities, new funding opportunities. We assist you with your prototype development, mentorship, and assist you with compliance and regulation because much, much of the products in innovation will require you to meet certain standards industry standards, industry compliance. So we assist you with that. Now we found that uh, particularly this funding, and I said we have 150 of them in our portfolio. This is sometimes just the right start that you need to actually get into the space of innovation and to kickstart uh, kick your startup uh, with this particular round of funding. Uh, some examples, and I wanna speak uh, briefly about TIHO, uh, which you see on your left. So Tiho uh, is from the Free State. His father is blind. And for many of you who are, who, who are living with uh, people that are blind will know that they cannot use a smartphone because they cannot maneuver through the, through the apps. Uh, the previous Nokia 3110 was the ideal phone to maneuver because it had these buttons and you could go up, down, and, and, and the, the two sides. But with the smartphone and you know smartphone flooding the markets, you'd find that uh, it's actually quite a impairment to blind people. So Tiho's uh, come up with this called Kaida device. It's the device that is synchronized with your smartphone and it's able for, for blind people to be able to manipulate 
the apps on their phone and through voice, they're able to, uh, to be able to uh, hear uh, what is being written and uh, on the apps. Uh, so um, what we find is that when we fund these innovators, they receive other funding from different partners. And in, in this case, he received 300,000 from the SAP Foundation, in addition to 260 that we provided him. And then now he's entered into another program of TIA and he's now received more funding uh, to be able to roll this out uh, or roll out his technology and create and validate his business model on this particular technology. Uh, we also have in TIA what we call living labs. And these are labs that we set up in communities. Uh, we are working very closely with Prof uh, at DUT to set up a lab in Mbali precinct. And we've actually uh, gone quite far. We will be executing that in April. Uh, and what the lab does is it has an innovation infrastructure. So it'll have a co-working space, a co-creation space, and it'll have ICT equipment, equipment for prototyping. It, it could have a digital training studio, 3D printing equipment. But it also takes uh, innovators through an innovation support program. And it takes you from ideation right up to when you are in the market with various types of accredited and non-accredited programs. And these, we have, uh, we, have 11, we have created 11 of them in various, in various communities uh, to be able to assist innovators. So thank you very much for your attention and your patience. I think I took more time than was necessary. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramsuran. And it was completely necessary because, you know, sometimes uh, young people, people just have all sorts of ideas, but they don't know where to get um, the necessary help or support. So, you know, it, it, it was quite um, interesting and also quite helpful to know uh, the type of work that TIA does, also the kind of innovations that, you know, they fund, um, also about funding and the innovation hubs as well. So it was quite informative. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I am going to give an opportunity to um, those that are attending this webinar to actually start posing their questions. As I said, we'll also give an opportunity to you as well if you want to ask your question live on Zoom to do that as well. But I also have questions of my own as well. And any of you of our panelists can actually answer this. Now, a lot of us are first generation something we first generation graduates or, you know, we, we, we have reached certain levels um, in terms of our accomplishments that those before us have not reached before. And, um, you know, uh, Professor Keu, you spoke about when you brought about the idea for your business that people said you were crazy. A lot of us go through that as well because we don't have people in our lives. We don't have frames of references as far as uh, entrepreneurship is concerned and cultivating that mindset. And that can actually also be quite an impediment because one might have the skills, but if that mindset is not cultivated and if we are not able to overcome the fear and over, also overcome the noise as well, um, you know, it can really set us back. So any of our panelists can answer that question, but uh, Professor Ike, if you can start with you as well, how were you able to sift through the noise and say, this has not been done before, but I'm going to be a pioneer? Professor Mutaun, can you hear what me? about me? I think it's just my personality. I don't <laughs> take... Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we Hello? can hear you. Go ahead, can you... Yes, yes, we can. Okay, thank you so much. I was just saying, one thing, uh, one thing about me, I don't usually take no for an answer. And because if I'm definitely sure that I'm right with this, whatever I wanted to do, I'm right, I've done my homework, I've done my research and it can be done. Even if you said it's not going to be done, I want to prove the people wrong. That for me is one of the things because quite often people are discouraged by people that didn't do it. I mean, if somebody didn't spin out her or his research, 
it's difficult for a person to say to you that it cannot be done because he has actually never or she has actually never walked the path. So how can all of a sudden start to tell you that it cannot be done? Then is one of the things that I always tell to the upcoming uh, 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 scientist and uh, 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 Dr. Lepotu is here because he's also one of my mentees that I used to say, don't allow the people to say it cannot be done whenever they didn't do it because they don't have never even walked the path, but all of a sudden they just tell you that it cannot be done. I think what is lacking here is to have a lot of mentors that they have walked the path so that they, if the mentee got discouraged, the mentee knew where he can go. So many people, even were in the working environment, you come in the working environment, you want to introduce something new in the working environment. Oh my God, they will tell you, oh my God, I've been in this company for 20 years. It cannot be done. Hello, it's not my problem that you've been in the company for 20 years, it cannot be done. Never say no, moreover where you know that you have done your research and your homework. So it was not easy. I can tell you from 2016, it was also not easy because everybody was looking at me as if I'm crazy. And I think if those two uh, business partners of mine who are students, they are here, they can testify to that because people were thinking that they are also crazy for not going to look for a job after they completed their PhD to start uh, working in the lab and creating that opportunity for themselves. Dr. Liputa, I see you nodding there as well. Would you like to um, also have an, your input? Yes, certainly. I, I agree with uh, Professor Mutaung that, you know, we need to move away from that mindset of, you know, um, thinking that it cannot be done and also listening to people who, are, who say that it cannot be done. Um, for instance, um, you know, in the community that I come from, there's people obviously who don't understand uh, what a nematologist does. Um, in fact, people, when they hear Dr. Lepoto, they're thinking medical doctor, for example. And when you, you know, explain that actually, no, I'm a nematologist and, you know, it shows that there's still a need for us as scientists to do a lot of science engagement and teach people about what we do. Similarly, with the investors and the funders, most of the time I found in my experience, sometimes they don't understand what I'm trying to do with the small microscopic worms that uh, earlier on you tried to, <laughs> to, to pronounce, the entomopathogenic nematodes. They wonder how are these worms capable of killing insects? This doesn't make sense. This, you know, how do I put my money into such an, you know, uh, into such a technology? But it takes a lot of courage and convincing to explain your technology, to also, I mean, probably pitch to the right people, but it's really challenging to also find the right people. But I'm glad that we've got Tia as well, who um, have given us the opportunity to come and pitch our ideas. And um, since I'm given um, you know, the platform to say that I'm coming back again to Tia to, to seek for support uh, and to seek for help uh, with my innovations. Thank you. No, I'm saying you're on mute. Uh, somebody. Okay. All right. Uh, I just wanted to find out if you've got input on this or if we should just move on, um, you know, to, to, to the questions. Uh, me? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, an, it's an important question, um, you know, and when I had reflected on kind of our own experience, uh, I deliberately started with this, this idea of, of stress versus passion. And, you know, whilst I think it's important to say to up and coming entrepreneurs and students that, you know, you got to, you got to pitch, you, you know, you, you have to keep enduring, but the idea of being passionate about what you do is really important um, because, because that distilled passion comes out in your engagements with people. I have been told more often than, than, uh, than, than I'd like to hear that I'm crazy, um, that we're investing in a lot of, a lot of things that don't have an academic end. 
Um, but you know, the, there's a lot of society itself is incredibly negative. You know, when, when we just listen to the cues we get from people, it's incredibly negative. So, you know, so the first thing I would say that's worked for us is is we've we've been told no often, but being passionate about what you do is really important. And then the second is um is really trying to solve a problem that 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 is a problem you you feel strongly about, but that is a problem for society, right? Um, and, and that's where um, I agree completely with Prof. Matong. You don't take no for an answer because many people will tell you no, but not have a solution themselves, the naysayers, right? And this is where you just forge through. You just forge through, you endure, um, and you be the one to bring the solution. And the market, we found this with biomimicry, the market wraps itself around you. Um, you know, and that was that's something unusual. We always say, go find the market, right? And I think that is a way of doing it. But there's also this phenomenon of you have a product that's just so fantastic, or you have an idea that's so fantastic that the market starts molding around that idea. And so, so both things work. And so I would say to people, you know, again, you know, you got to really care. Care enough that when you smack down a hundred times, you keep coming up again. And, and you have to, you know, you have to address the pressing problem. And then the last thing is that I often find in, in this, I find with myself too, you know, we think we're speaking clearly. We think we're pitching clearly. But often, often we're not, you know, so I have a rule. I now give all my talks and, and anything I pitch to my 17-year-old daughter and my 76-year-old mother. And, and across that, that entire value chain, they have to get it. Then I know I'm messaging it correctly. And so that's the final point. I'll say that this is something you never get uh, the best at. This is something you're always learning. And so always take the opportunity to, to learn how to pitch, to learn how to communicate, to learn how to tell people the value of what you do. You just get better with time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm just going to go to some of the, the questions that have been posed, and I'm going to start with the live questions. So we've got Nogubonga Mbanzi and Farai Zige who've raised their hands. They want to ask their questions. I'm first going to start with Nogubonga and then Farai, and then I'll give our panelists the um, opportunity to respond to your questions. Nogubonga, if we could kindly uh unmute her. Hi, hello. Can anyone, everyone hear me? Very oh, okay. clearly. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. I would like to uh, uh, send my appreciation to all the speakers. They are very inspiring. My name is Nokbong Ambanzi from uh, SIAP. I'm a postdoc here. I guess my questions would uh, be posed to everyone. I think anyone, anyone in, the, in the panelist can can um respond to this one so my question is as um a project you know in a project as a student you have your pi your mentors if you have an idea and then you want to 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 start your business or start commercializing your 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 project how do you go about it do you do you start pitching the idea first to your pi uh, your mentors or you can just go do, do it yourself. And also again, in the case of the funders, you're being funded by uh, maybe NRF or any other sponsors. Do you first have to check the policies that will allow you to just do your, 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 your start your business or how do you go about all this stuff? That's what I want to know, thank you. Thanks, Nogubonga. Also, just to um, Farai, who's coming, let's let's just try and keep to one idea at a time so that we give everybody the opportunity to pose their own questions. Farai, please, please go ahead. If we uh, can... Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, um, yes, uh, my question is, um... Uh, uh, similar to the second question, which was posed by Nogbonga. It's all about funding, eh? You see, uh, but before I go there, uh, let me uh, express a little bit of a disappointment that um, uh, I, 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 I think I was anticipating to hear a beautiful story from someone who is not into biomedical. You see, a uh, uh, Prof. Daung is biomedical, uh, uh, Dr. Lipoto is biomedical, uh, Prof. Kana is biomedical. Who's, uh, who has got a beautiful story to tell from engineering, uh, from, from construction, from any uh, a, a different discipline? But anyway, 
that's a story for another day. But what I wanted to ask, um, a, a, a Prof. Mtawong would, uh, would actually support me here. You see, we, within the academic fraternity where we'll be trying to commercialize our, our, our activities, um, a lot of things is said on ideation and how you project your, your work towards commercialization. But the, the story of money, access to money, is not really said out properly. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy that uh, you, uh, all of you guys are talking about thanks to TIA, thanks to TIA, thanks to TIA. I'm beginning to think that TIA is biased towards biomedical people and it doesn't look to, mm -hmm. uh, to, to some of us who are not into biomedical. But um, uh, the, my point is, uh, if we can uh, have some clarity, maybe you can also assist me here now that how do you really access funding at different stages of your project development, uh, towards commercialization because it looks like it's one hell of a frustrating story to potential um, uh, academic commercialization of research work. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Farai Nogubonga and Farai there having uh, similar questions as, as far as funding is concerned, but also Nogubonga asking that once you have this idea, where's the starting point in terms of uh, pitching it? So I, I, who, who's going to start first with tackling both questions? Uh, let me start first. Uh, can you hear me? Let me? Go ahead, Prof. Let me start first. Yes, I'm gonna start first with both tackling the question. To Nokubonga, uh, your idea, it depends what kind of an idea you're talking about. Um, if it is an idea that is going to be need, maybe you want to, uh, to develop a product for hair, let me make it as an example. And then you are working in the lab and then you've got a PI. What is very important, you need to understand if this is going to be your research idea, do you have the, the, the resources and the facilities where you're going to do it? Uh, because now I'm not sure whether are you talking about an idea while you are in the university or are you talking about an idea while you are not? Because there are two different kinds of ideas that you can talk about. It can be an idea while you are an undergraduate that uh, at DUT, we usually take it as a startup. And then we can assist you with that idea is your idea. We assist you with the idea, we refine it until you know it becomes something. There's a different idea at the undergraduate level. Now, now you talk about an idea at the postgraduate level. If this is your idea at the postgraduate level, and then you've got a supervisor, it might be a little bit difficult if you've got a supervisor who don't understand your idea, how he's going to execute it. And then if you talk about that idea and then you don't have the resources, that might create a problem as well. Perhaps you should have clarified so that I could be able to see how can I assist you in terms of this idea that you talked about. Now, what we have done at this present moment, um, uh, 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 students can or entrepreneur even actually NIPMO allows that um, students or, or, or entrepreneur can actually license some of this technology uh, uh, from from the university. Now, if this idea of those that you're talking about, a uh, university is going to assist you with this idea. Just know at the end of the day, if it was done at the university, that IP that intellectual property belongs to the university. Now, nothing stop you to license their technology from the university. That was what I was talking about. So perhaps you will clarify about the idea so that one could be able to understand and to assist you because there's an idea at the undergraduate level, which we've got in our university. There's an idea at the postgraduate level. Now, uh, with uh, 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 Dr. Zike, um, I must uh, tell something that uh, British Council, uh, they are now in the roadshow of uh, assisting the arts, the humanities to commercialize their research. Now, with the, with the, with the arts and the humanities, most of the time you see that is a service. But, and I always say a big but, when you do research, whether you are a social scientist, whether you are a STEM, you do research. You both going to get the results, whether it's from the social scientist or from the STEM, you get results. You disclose that to the patent. I don't see any difference between the two, whether it was the, 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 
the stems were not there or the humanities were not there. Because at the end of the day, when you do a value proposition canvas model, it's not gonna be said, this one is for the arts, this one is for the STEM, is exactly the same thing. So for me, uh, uh, commercialization of research, whether you from what uh, STEM or from the social sciences is exactly the same thing. You just need to understand other can be a software, others can be a service, other can be a product. Other can be a method that you have developed in the lab and you something that was unique for TV method and you can go and license that method. So people need to understand that in terms of that. Now, in terms of funding, I don't agree with you. Uh, by saying to you, I'm going to be brutally honest, scientists, scientists, they don't know how to complete an application form that is related to business. Even if they are professors, I sit there always, make sure that before those tier application can go to tier, I sit down and check them. You could see that they are, when you ask, let me make an example, and it's not like I'm ridiculing them. I'm just being honest. You ask them, what is your technology readiness level of your product? And then tier application is one, two, nine. All the beautiful scientists, they will put X in all of them. One, two, three, but that on its own is a problem. So we need also to understand and to acknowledge where is our shortfall with the scientists. If you have completed something like that and you submit it to TIA, I'm being brutally honest with you. By the time they take that application and then you have completed, you don't even know understanding the technology readiness level. I need that with due respect. I know you want to throw it away because you're going to say this person does not know what he's doing. So let's also go back to the drawing board. Do we know how to write a grant proposal or between the two together in terms of this is for NRF for grant, this is for TIA for business so that we don't point fingers to poor tier. It's not like I'm advocating for tier, by the way. It's because I've got an experience. For pure tier to keep on saying they don't fund. Look at how did you submit your application to them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor, uh, uh, Dr. Um, Suran, I see you've got your hand up. Um, if you could please go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. I wanted to respond to the questions around access to funding. Um, so I think it's a misnomer that there isn't funding. There is funding in the ecosystem. I think access, how do you access that funding maybe is the concern, right? So what Prof has just said is about how you structure your proposal to meet the requirements of the funding agency. And I'm not talking particularly to TIA. I can talk about any investor. If you apply for funding to the IDC, if you apply funding to angel investors or VC companies, you would need to look at what they are actually looking for. And it's very important to structure your proposal uh, according to those lines. When TIA releases a call, we release guidelines in terms of about what we'll fund, what we won't fund, what we're looking for. Sometimes our calls are targeted. For an example, I may release a call uh, on grassroots innovation to just a particular district, uh, an Ubu district, for an example. So I'll be looking particularly for people who come from the district. You don't, you don't, uh, if you come from another district, you cannot apply to that call. So it's very important to pay attention to the requirements of the call. Uh, and that is that is key. It's very important that you can art you must articulate the technical, the technology, right? And if you need assistance or art articulating the technology, you need to contact uh, a, a manager, a portfolio manager at TIA that will assist you. So it's not always that you put in your application and it's just an uh, online system and we, it's just machines working behind the scene to actually evaluate the sector. There are people behind that, people that you can talk to. So if you have a, uh, you wanna engage with a portfolio manager in advanced manufacturing, because you've got a civil engineering technology that you want uh, to the look at, you have that opportunity to engage. But Prof has provided some very useful uh, advice as well. It's always uh, important to, to test your application with, with your peers, with people that have been successful, et cetera. Should the uh, students want uh, TIA to do a, a workshop with them, I'm willing to facilitate that workshop where we can take you through some of our various fin uh, funding instruments and what are the requirements for those various funding instruments, uh, what are we looking for, what are some of the do's and don'ts about that. Uh, we can make that available. And we, we find all sectors except the sex trade and the drug sector. 
Uh, so those are drugs that are uh, uh, harmful drugs. Uh, obviously, there are other drugs that we will fund that are that are useful, but we won't fund those sectors. So if there's no bias towards the towards the biomedical, uh, it just so happened that the speakers in this meeting uh, happen to fall within that space. But across, we will fund across the the sectors, and you'd find that once you are a recipient of a tier funding, uh, for an example, if I have to take uh, Prof Bavesh in the meeting that other funding opportunities open up to you. And we've seen that a pattern with a lot of our innovators. Uh, we deal with about 500, 600 innovation projects uh, in a year that we fund. And you'll see that a lot of other funding opportunities. So you need to learn the funding, the access to funding game because different organizations do it differently, but there's always the backend support to that. It's not that you would be left alone uh, in uh, putting in your application. Thank you, uh, Program Director. I think I'll stop at that in terms of Thank my Thank you, Doc. Um, Prof. Kana and um, Doc, I'm also going to give you, uh, Doc Lipod, just an opportunity to speak into this question. Two minutes each, I'm looking at the time and I just want to get as many questions in as possible. Okay, I won't be long. Just just to add to what, people, what speakers have said, Asino Kubonga is a postdoctoral researcher. And so, so I would just say that you know, if it's emanating from your research within that space, it is something that you should discuss with your mentor, um, because you know it's the, the idea has been developed in an ecosystem. The one thing I would caution everyone is, is you know, if if an idea is going to be submitted for patenting, it is you should just be careful where and how you discuss it. And it should be discussed in safe spaces like university technology transfer offices or you know spaces that are somewhat protected. And then, and then regards kind of you know the the representation. Perhaps I, I should have made this clearer, but really our innovation has been through the partnership with engineers, with lawyers, with you know. So so we should also move beyond these disciplines. You know the problems of society are not going to be solved by a single discipline approach. It's got to be solved by a multidiscipline approach. Thank you. Okay. Um, I also just wanted to briefly um, um, address the issue of there's no funding or, you know, funding is for certain people. Um, just from my own experience, um, a lot of projects that I've done, I've actually funded myself. They're self-funded. The Afro Royal product, the hair product that I've shown, uh, shown you guys during my presentation, I actually use some of my skills. I bake, I cook and I charge people for that. So on my spare time, I just sell cakes and I keep that money in a safe space. I've actually used that, fun, that money that I've generated from other skills that I, I can, I, that I have to grow my other business. So Afro Royal hair products are genuinely self-funded from the work that I do also. My hobbies actually fund my business. Um, the science graduate in Daba that I hosted last year, it was totally self-funded by myself. So I just want us also to keep an open mind to say it's not always about waiting to be funded or getting funding. Sometimes we need to make means to start. The biggest thing is to start. If you've got an idea, it doesn't matter how small you start, but you just have to invest yourself into your project and also use your own funds if you could even get funding from get a loan from the bank and it, as long as you can start as long as you can kickstart your 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 project i think that's very important and lastly uh speaking about professor mtang's book about we don't know how to write our business plans i agree with her in a sense that that's why i felt the need to do an MBA because I became honest with myself and I said, I'm a scientist. Yes, I, I know how to come up with ideas, but do I actually understand strategies and business models that are required for me to be able to take my product to the market? So pro, there's, there, there's a lot of programs. You don't necessarily need to do an MBA. There's pro programs by CEDA, by the NYDA, some also offered by DSI um, and GDAD that they help us to be more business-minded, to know how to access the market, to know how to even commercialize our pro products. Thank okay, you. I'm 
Thank you. I'm going to allow one more question uh, from Temba Lukele. You've got your hand up. Uh, hopefully it's a different question because I think a lot has been said about funding. Go ahead. Hi, good afternoon colleagues. Uh, thanks Nomsa. My name is Temba Lukele uh, from Pumalanga province. I um, just completed my PhD, which I was doing under the Nelson Mandela University in construction. Uh, project management to be specific. Uh, yes, mine would be kind of a little bit different, though somehow related. Uh, I was so touched when I was shown the statistics by Professor Ramsala that in Bumalanga province, you only have beneficiaries of 0 0.5 from your program. Uh, I would like maybe to get advice as to where do we locate your center, innovation centers here in Bumalanga so that we can start frequently to work with your office. I'm also a lecturer, by the way, at the University of Pumala. Um, also a, a co-faculty advisor for the NECTAS team for the university. So we often do some of projects which are related to innovation in the science space. So we'll kindly like to know exactly where do you find some of your offices or centers here in Pumala. Then secondly, I have a, also a question as to how do I go about in terms of registering our idea in terms of protecting it or intellectual property. Maybe it cannot be an, a, a product per se, but as a model or a, met, a method of doing something which is more innovative. How, how do we register or which uh, institution do we have to consult for that registration? Thank you very much, Noms. Okay, Dr. Lipoto, will you tackle that question for us? Do you have your hand up to answer it? Or is your hand from uh, the previous question? You are muted. Okay, uh, any, anyone from our panelists who'd like to tackle that question for Temba? Anyone, anyone to assist Temba? So, so if I think I understand the question, it's where to kind of place innovation centers. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, so, so really, really, you know, I, I think the idea of strengthening, you know, university technology transfer offices is really important. Um, a, perhaps there is insufficient capacity and, and B, they, they may perhaps they're not visible enough. Um, but really, I, I would say, you know, placing this within the technology transfer office that has the, re the relevant skills for commercialization, you know, and understanding of the IPR Act and understanding of national intellectual property management, etc. Um, that would be a that would be a way to go. Prof K, I also saw your message briefly about that one cannot patent an idea. If you could please, I think that's one of the questions that uh, Temba um, asked as well. If you could just briefly educate us as far as that is concerned. Okay, thank you so thank you so much, our uh, colleagues. A lot of people always think that when they've got an idea, they want to protect it. Um, to protect your idea is before you discuss it, you can ask whoever you're going to discuss it to sign a non-disclosure uh, agreement. That's what's important. A lot of people don't do that. And then at the end of the day, they start uh, saying that people, they stole their idea uh, because you can't patent it. It's, it's, it's a fact. One of the things that, that, that you can patent, you can patent something that you have already perhaps uh, 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 did an experimental. I'm gonna talk more about my field because where you did a research and you were able to get something, whether it's novelty, that you can be able to patent, whether it was something to do with the gene that you managed to get it when you were doing research, or you were looking for a certain gene that one can use it to diagnose cancer or whatever. Those are the kind of things that one can go out and patent it. But you can't say, I've got an idea, and then an idea of diagnosing cancer, I want to patent that idea. That's what I'm trying to say. You cannot patent. You need to do the work so that you see what you are really going to patent. 
Thank you so much. Um, I've got a question here, and uh, that's going to be the last question before we round off this discussion. And the question says, if you've completed your master's already, how do you go about uh, starting a business from it if the university owns a certain portion of your research due, it, due to it being conducted at their institution? And then another question is, how important is industry experience? And um, Doc Ramsuran, I, I want to, to um, pose that question to you because you deal with a lot of young people uh, as well. So how important is industry experience when one is starting their own business? Can they start it just straight from school or is it advised that they tap into the industry and then withdraw to launch their own business? Uh, no, thanks, um, Program Director. Uh, yes, I will respond to the question. Uh, but the first question regarding uh, the university and the, sh and the IP, I think uh, every university has a particular uh, IP policy. Uh, the students need to look into uh, that policy with the tech transfer office. Uh, then they'll know how they can move from there. So the tech transfer office is critical uh, in that engagement. Regarding the industry, uh, it's important to understand the industry rather than have work experience in the industry. Uh, it's important to understand the markets that open up in a particular sector. I think that is key uh, to, to your being successful in the funding stream. So we don't have necessarily ask for industry experience, but what we ask is your technology uh, experience. Because if you are developing a technology in the ICT space, and you uh, and, 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 and Prof mentioned that we need to look at a multidisciplinary focus, but if it's a mainly ICT solution for an agricultural industry, and if you have no uh, experience in agriculture or no experience in ICT, that is a bit of a, a red flag in terms of funding. So it's uh, so also it's not that you should leave. Uh, it's not that you should go into industry and then come back and innovate. I have a school learner who we funded in when he was 11, in grade 11 uh, at 17 years, and he's now created his own startup, received lots of other funding besides the tier funding uh, to create, uh, you know, to create his startup. So it doesn't have to be that you need to, you need to leave your work, you need to leave, go into industry, understand the market. You can understand the markets, don't have to be in industry. Thanks, Chairperson, uh, Program Director. Prof Kana, I see you nodding your head there. Would you like to say something before we round off? Yeah, just, I mean, it's a, it's a very important question. You know, if you want to start a business, how do you do it? Because, you know, I must admit, we did this a few years back and, and you know, we think we, we know how this works, but actually it's very difficult when you're walking the road. And in many cases, we kind of, you know, we made the rules as we went along. Um, so, so there are two ways of doing this. If the business sits outside of the university um, and there are benefits and, and disadvantages to that, the simplest way is to get a license from the university to actually commercialize that IP outside of the university space. If you want the business to exist as a partnership you know, between the university and some sort of private entity, there are no more guidelines as to how that is actually done. And again, perhaps there are, there are benefits and disadvantages to that too. You know, you, you're part of a bigger structure, but, but it is something that's an important, it's, it's an important point. In, and so it, there are ways to do it. Um, you know, I would suggest the first thing to do is to sit down and talk with the university technology transfer office and have, a, and have an idea of what it is you want. So if you want the business to sit outside, start with stabling the idea of a licensing agreement and perhaps make it an, ex an exclusive license. So that the university only licenses to you. So you have a chance of being successful. It can be exclusive for two or three years. You know, and if you haven't been able to be successful, they can license elsewhere. So, so that can be done. It just depends what you want. Mm. Thank you so, so much. And also thank you so much because one of the questions that I wanted to ask in the beginning was, all of you are in the STEM space. What about us and you know, social sciences? But all of that has been answered, which I'm happy about that there is space. And one thing that I've really picked up is, yes, we have a lot of problems, more especially in South Africa, but the more problems we have, the more solutions we need, and it creates more opportunity, right? 
for us in, to innovate in order to, to address those problems. So that's my, my takeaway from today. But I'm going to give you a minute each just to give your parting shot, just a minute, just words that you want us to um, to walk away with, you know, as far as this topic is concerned, um, cultivating an entrepreneurial mindset, because it all starts in the mind. Um, and, you know, uh, Professor Brava, doctor, also said it, they had a wild imagination, and that's how uh, their innovation started about. So just your parting shots, a minute each, and then, um, and then we'll round off the discussion. I will start with, uh, let me start with Professor Kana, and then I will go to Dr. Lipotu, and then Professor Mutaung, and then Dr. Ramsuran. Thank you. So I guess as a, as a parting shot, I would say to people, try to create meaning from what you do. This is really the space I'm in now. Create meaning, you know, you're going to set out to solve problems and do them in a meaningful way. And believe in yourself. More people will tell you no than people who tell you yes. But believe in yourself. The, the creativity, the entrepreneurship, the drive, the passion that I see in the youngsters that I engage with is just absolutely inspiring. You know, it's something unique to our society. Believe in yourself. You can do this. Just don't take no for an answer. Thank you. I agree with Prof Kana. Indeed, you need to believe in yourself. Uh, most importantly, love what you do. Um, never give up. My name is Diset, so it means perseverance. So each time I think of, ah, maybe I should stop doing this. I remember who I am. I'm Diset, so I need to persist. I need to keep going and never be afraid to seek for help, uh, to ask for mentorship, to write to people whom you think are fitting to be your mentors. Write to them and ask for help. And most importantly, um, never forget the power of your potential. Your dreams have actually, they can, they can drive you to achieve um, a lot. So if you dream about something, you put action into it and you work on it continuously. As you can see, I'm, I'm, I'm in my Nematech uniform. It's because I believe in my brain. I believe that Nematech has the power to impact the world. Everywhere I go, literally, I've got my Nematech cap, going on so you believe in yourself you motivate yourself and never be afraid um, to actually seek for advice and assistance from others thank you professor Mutau. Uh, i had a problem with the other device to swap from the other device and um <laughs> the challenges that i had you yeah, found a I solution wouldn't... that's all that matters <laughs> device all what i want to say to uh, to the colleagues here especially to the students entrepreneur have a passion on what you are doing i think they can see me i've got a passion if they don't have a passion they can go and buy it in woolworths i'm joking but have a passion on what you are doing and um, have a dream and remember this is your dream is not your supervisor's dream is not your mother's dream and like what jesus is saying have a passion and then perseverance you are going to tell the people they're going to tell you that it's not going to work i remember i won't mention that pharmaceutical company when i was sharing my products with that pharmaceutical company they said to me this thing is not going to work what what all of a sudden you're not going to tell us that this can regenerate bone this can do this and later on i gave them the sample just to go and try the ceo of this company after I gave the CEO of that company the sample to go and try, the CEO started saying, can, you, can we start talking? What is this? What is this? I said, no, because they were not believing in me. And because I was not so scared to go into that boardroom in the pharmaceutical space, but being a black female, it was not easy when you were pitching your, your products. Where they pretend, Before you can even finish, that says, oh, it's not going to work. You know, you don't know what you're doing. This is not going to work. So always make sure that there are those people that are waiting to say it won't work. Always remember me. We say, Prof. Motown said, they used to say it won't work and I've proven them wrong and I'm still proving them wrong. That's what I can just say. Never give up. Thank you. Dr. Ramsuran. Okay, now I think um, just to end up by saying, uh, Tia has always been open for business. Uh, we are very keen on funding youth 
uh, which most of the uh, participants will probably fall in that group. It's a very important sector for us. Uh, so put in your applications, you need help, uh, contact us in TIA. There may come an, a time when we would do an assessment and we would say that this may not work. It may not be commercially viable. If you don't agree with us, you need to seek another opinion. Uh, you need to come back to us, but you need to accept that sometimes that not all research is going to be commercially viable. Uh, and then you must have, you must be very clear about the problem you're trying to solve and the market, uh, the market valuation on that, the markets you're trying to access. It's critically important uh, that, that you do this. You'll find a lot of innovation sitting at universities that is not commercialized. And one of the things we are doing, and you'll probably receive an invitation soon, is saying, how can we take the uh, intellectual property sitting at universities and offer them to entrepreneurs and grassroots innovators uh, through a licensing agreement or some other form uh, so that they can now be commercialized. So you'll find there's many ways in which you can take your ideas forward, or you could take ideas at universities forward. You just need to persevere. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think next time these webinars should just be three hours because there's just a lot to talk about and we just want to go on and on and on. I know there are a lot of questions that have been posed. So I'm going to have a chat with the coordinator of this webinar. Uh, if you'd like, please leave your email addresses. And uh, what we'll do is maybe try and curate the um, the questions, see if they're in fresh questions. And if our panelists uh, permit and if they have time perhaps they can answer them in writing and then we can get back to you but it's 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 permission that I'll <laughs> I'll seek uh, from our panelists and our coordinator as well but just an idea a lot of you wanted to really post your questions which are all important but because of time we couldn't so let's try and make a, a, a plan in order to accommodate you as well but Professor Mutaung, Professor Kana, Dr. Leputu, and Dr. Ramsuran, this has been so insightful. I mean, <laughs> thank you so, so much. Um, really, we we walking away with so much. Thank you for making the time. Thank you for imparting your knowledge. But also thank you for being um for causing change, you know, in society through the work that we do. A lot of the times it's just, oh, scientists, scientists, but we actually speak to people um, whose results are so tangible, uh, whom we can see who, who are, you know, developing others in the process who are also in the academic space. It's really a source of encouragement for a lot of us. So, Thank you for making the time this afternoon and thank you for allowing us to steal an extra 20 minutes of your time. We really appreciate it. Also, everybody who participated, who joined this webinar this afternoon, thank you to those as well who were brave enough to pose their questions live. And also to the National Research Foundation for creating this platform uh, where we can have these debates, where we have the caliber of panelists that we had. Uh, we really thank you for your contribution and for creating this platform as well. Have a lovely afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for everything. Bye. Bye.